how can I take this thing that I love doing to the next level? Some people will remember Joel Corey as a fitness model. Others will remember him as a star of TV reality show, Geordie Shaw. But now everyone knows Joel Corey as a chart-topping, globe-trotting DJ. But what from the outside and thanks to social media made it like overnight success or his star seemingly rising out of nowhere has actually been a decade plus of hard work, graft, setbacks and sacrifice. I've come to Ibiza to find out exactly what Joel's done to get to the place he is now, achieving all of his dreams and most importantly asking him what comes next. I first met you, or I first knew of you, when you were, you're kind of a bodybuilder, right? You're all a fitness model, working with Optimum Nutrition. A lot of people have known you through that. A lot of people have known you through Geordie Shaw. <laughs> Obviously, a lot more people now know you as a DJ. Has music always been your calling? Has that been the passion since as young as you can remember? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I got my first pair of decks um, for Christmas when I was like 13 years old. Right. And, you know, DJing was always my biggest hobby growing up. Um, started. DJing in the garage days on vinyls. Uh, so it's really different now. Yeah, but back yeah, then yeah. it was such a hobby of mine. I used to go to the record shop every week with my best mate. Um, I'd save up my pocket money just to buy that vinyl every single week and get the bus <laughs> up there. You know, I'm so glad I kind of was in that era though. Right. Because, you know, the sort of art of DJing, it meant a bit more back then. Um, so, yeah, you know, growing up through my teenage years, um, I was DJing at people's birthday parties. I started a little mobile disco company, so I was doing people's weddings, bar mitzvahs. Right, everything. You know, even DJing at a few people's 40ths, <laughs> even did a few 60ths. Um, so like a broad range of sort of like crowds I'll be playing in, in front of every week. Um, and it was a really good way for me to learn DJing and learn how to work a dance floor and have a broad range of sort of music knowledge. Yeah. And then I got onto the club scene in my early 20s. I had residencies all around London. I used to DJ on the Mayfair circuit. Um, those sort of like bougie nightclubs in uh -huh. London and and then in the summers I'd go abroad and I'd DJ on the summer resorts places like Magaluf and Zanti, Malia, some bits and bobs in Ibiza. Um, you know that was before I had any success with my music that was me just being a club DJ you know getting myself out there pushing sort of my mixes on SoundCloud and kind of hustling that just way. Grafting. Grafting man I was um, you know sometimes DJing five six nights a week and um, I even, you know, at one point I finished uni and I had a, in my 20s, I had a full time job at MTV and then I'll DJ my club gigs after, after work in the, right. in the week and on weekends. Right. Um, so yeah, I've always been a club DJ, I've always been DJing and just got to a point, mate, where I was like, how can I take this thing that I love doing and I'm good at to the next level? And that was, you know, really focusing on production and get my own music out there and try and get a hit record because right. that's how you take it to the next level. Because I think a lot of people will look at your Instagram or, or see your interviews or see you on TV and just think, oh, you've come from nowhere, you're this overnight success. Yeah. But you and I have spoken before. I know that it's been a long time coming, right? It's taken 10, 15 years for you to yeah. be an overnight success. Yeah, and ov overnight success in 10 years, mate, <laughs> is the truth. <laughs> and and your, you know, your first release, what, 20, 2014, 2015? Yeah. And the big hit came in 2019. Talk yeah. to me about what it was like is like that job in DJ, grafting, you know, you're touring the UK, you're turning up, you're promoting gigs where you told me before, no, literally no one turned up. Yeah. Can you give me a little bit of sense of what it was like when you were really putting in those hours and you weren't seeing the success? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I was DJing every gig that I could take, really. Um, you know, I'd just get my name on that flyer, um, you know, pushing my sort of name on social media as much as I could and like putting my mixes on SoundCloud and after my gigs I would go out into the crowd and hand out CDs to the people on the dance floor and for me it was just about getting in front of as many people as possible right as many nights as possible so um, of course you know did you was, turn anything down or was it just I was yes, turning yes, nothing yes. I said yes to everything man <laughs> I just wanted to be in front of people you know it didn't matter 
how far away it was or how long the drive was. Didn't really care about the money. I just, I just knew that the best way for me to sort of build what I was doing was just to DJ as much as possible. And of course, you know, every DJ that's, that's been doing it for years has always done bad gigs, man. And that's part of, part of the process. You know, those, those sort of moments make you stronger. I mean, there were so many times where I would drive up the motorway, like, you know, three, four hours, turn up to a gig, you know, that had my, my face on it and it'd been advertised me being there and they wouldn't, there'd be no one there. So been, what, what was it like at that moment? Because you're such a positive guy, right? And it, I guess it's easy or it's easier to look back on hindsight once you've had that success to go, yeah, I had to go through it. But at the time, you must have been heartbroken. Yeah, man. You know, in those moments, obviously it is, is disheartening um, and, it, and it does hurt. Um, but did you have to have like a little pep talk to yourself? No, or no, just listen, I'd, I'm always carrying myself professionally. So I'd always go in there, still have a smile, right. still do my set, you know, unless the manager was like, don't worry about change. it. You know, you wouldn't no, dial it down, it's still 100%. Not, no, 100% not, man. Because even if there was a few people in there, I still want to give them the best show that I could have given them. Um, and always, you know, stay professional in those situations. But like I said, that's just part, I mean, many DJs would have done those sort of gigs, man. I mean, when, when I first started DJing, like I said, I used to DJ in the p local pub down the road. <laughs> and like, sometimes there'll just be the old geezer sitting right. in the corner. Not, not so it's, to you, really. Yeah, it's not like I hadn't done that sort of thing before. <laughs> um, and I'm sure those gigs will happen again, man. You, you know, you, you never know. But um, in those moments, you just suck it up and get on with it. And, you know. Did you, just, have, did you have like the, the foresight or the ability to go, do you know what? This is helped. It might not feel like it now, but I know this is all part of a process. This is going to help me down the road. Or is it a case of I've just got to get through tonight and then reassess? Um, no, I think I always had that longer term vision always stuck in my mind. Right. I, for me, like, I would have done anything it took to make my break. Okay. It was going to happen. Right. I, I would never take no for an answer. Do you know what I mean? I was like, I'm going to stick at this until it happens. I'm not sort of certain person would ever give up. And um, even though, like, there was a lot of setbacks on the way, you know, a lot of sort of like, moments where I was like, oh, you know, maybe this is not going to happen. I even remember my mum saying to me a few times, I can, I can literally vision sitting in the kitchen and her kind of saying, you know, you sure you don't want to, you know, look at another career, you know, you're getting close to 30 now, Joel, like this DJing thing, you can't be doing it forever. Like she saw me like putting out music and maybe it not really connecting and going through some bad record deals and, you know, all the stresses of that and, and spending money on my own promotion and campaigns to get these records out. Cause it costs a lot when you're doing it yourself. Yeah, sure. And she was, sometimes, I remember her saying like, you know, what, what's the plan B? And I said to her, there's no plan B, it's just plan A. Because it must be hard to hear that because she obviously cares about you more than anyone else in the world, right? And she's trying to protect you by saying, maybe this isn't for you. But it sounds as though that was almost like water off a duck's back and nothing was going to deter you, even your mum saying, maybe time for something else, Joel. I think my mum knew deep down the person I was and I would have stopped at nothing to make it happen right and um, you know my mum is is my rock man she's been there through all the ups and downs and I know that what's happened now has definitely made her so proud because she's seen me in all those difficult moments man it must be really hard to kind of pull yourself up when you have gone through that and I think when I speak to people who've had a lot of success in their field like yourself obviously comes down to talent it obviously comes down to work ethic but i think the resilience like bouncing back from the disappointment especially the longer you've been doing it maybe you're not getting anywhere it's another setback have you always had that work ethic and more importantly have you always had that resilience that sense of nothing is going to stop me yeah i've always had that in me i'm not sure where it comes from but you know even when i look back to when i did the fitness competitions yeah. you know they were, that was a real mental test going through those years and preparing for those competitions and getting into that sort of condition that I was physically. Um, and I, I think not many people can do that is the truth because mm -hmm. you really have to dig deep and push your body to the absolute limit and your mind. And, um, you know, I've kind of carried that same, as you call it, resilience, whatever, in, in my music career that, um, you know, as I said, whatever happened in my mind, this was going to happen. And I would pre be prepared to work to the bitter end until it, until it happened, you know. And did you feel like it was something that was always in your control? You, if you kept doing what you were doing, it didn't matter how many knockbacks you got, how many rejections, if you just kept doing it and kept believing, it was gonna happen. Is that, uh, is that a right kind of vibe? You know what? I always believed that exact thing. Right. I had that in my mind. I, I would literally say to myself, surely if I want something this badly and I work this hard, surely it will happen. I don't know what time frame it's going to happen in you know it took me years until i actually got like my break yeah 
But I always remember saying to myself is, Joel, surely like if somebody wants something so much in their life, surely it's going to happen. We've talked kind of about those early days and trying to find your path, trying to find the road to success. But you were told by people very, very close to you, including your mum, right, that maybe you should be doing something else. How was that experience? How did that feel? Did that make you think twice or were you still 100% dedicated on what you're doing? There was, there was definitely a few moments where, where maybe I was like questioning it a little bit as I was getting like, you know, closer to 30 and I was spending a lot of my own money promoting myself as a DJ and putting my music out there. Um, you know, because before I was signed to, you know, a major record label that I am now, I didn't really have that support of a team. Mm -hmm. It was kind of me self-promoting, me trying to get my stuff played on radio, right. me paying for artworks, for music videos. This stuff costs a lot of money. You you're know? a one-man band, essentially, doing it all yourself. Yeah, and, um, you know, when you go and you go and again, and you're not seeing the results, you are like, Oh, is this going to happen? Did you give yourself a firm deadline, like turning 30 or turning 35? Was it ever kind you... of like, I'm going to get to that point and if I've not done it by then, I'm not going to do it? You know what? In those moments where I questioned it, it still wasn't enough to ever right. defer me. So no, I never had a I, In my mind, I was always so like, this is going to happen. It will happen. Just keep going, Joel. I just believed if somebody wants something so badly in life, it's going to happen. I remember saying that to myself. I was Even like, when your mum's saying to you, maybe it's time for plan B. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I just think, you know, parents are always going to, you know, as you said, like protect their children. And, and um, you know, th this whole DJing thing and having hit records doesn't feel like a dream. And it does to most people because it is. It's, <laughs> it's one in a million. Do you know what I mean? It's so competitive out there. And it does feel a bit up in the clouds. Um, so it's totally understandable for people to be like, you know, what, what's the backup plan? But for me, even though it did seem like such a dream, I wanted it so badly that I would stop at nothing to make it happen. If you could sum up in a few words what that five year period from your first release to, you know, 2019, what was that period like if you could sum it up? <laughs> um, I would say it was, it was a struggle. It was. I'm not going to lie, you know, it was a struggle, man. It was a, it was a lot of, um, sacrifice in time, money, um, and like you said, I was a bit of a one-man band, uh, just trying to make this dream happen. Yeah. Um, and you know, moments of uncertainty. But when it did happen, oh mate, it tasted so sweet. I want to come to that in a minute. <laughs> but before we do, like, because you must have spent what being a one-man band. You're spending a lot of time on by yourself. You're yeah. traveling. Like you, that's a lot of time in your own head when you're struggling. Yeah. How did you deal with that process when you are feeling a bit low? Talk to me how you kind of navigate that because for a lot of people that might be a bit too overwhelming. Yeah, I did spend um, a lot of time alone, and and you know I am actually okay with my own time and being alone. Um, I am my career, and I wouldn't even call it my job. It's my life. Right. You know. Um, is everything to me. It is absolutely everything to me. And that is my focus, that is my love. And I'm willing, I am willing to commit all my time to, to it. And um, I've never really felt, you know, that I'm lonely. I'm so busy as well, there's right. so much to do all the time um, that I've never had that need of like, I'm missing out on something. I mean, so do you think you're particularly mentally strong then? Because I think a lot of people in those moments where you are coming back from a gig where no one's turned up, I mean, you question everything. You must have a great support network or incredible inner resilience or strength to, to get through that. Where do you think you are on that? Was it? Yeah. Are you just very mentally strong and very resilient to these kind of setbacks? I feel like, um, you know, maybe being through so many years on this journey, it has actually made me quite mentally strong. I, right. I, I would believe that I am, yes. Um, I do have, you know, my inner circle with, with, with my family, you know, my brother, my sister, my mum and my dad, who, um, you know, are always there for me. I've got a few close mates that I trust and that is just literally my small little circle. Um, but outside of that, you know, I don't really have like a big group of close friends, um, but that comes from just focusing on this one thing that I had to do, you know, yeah. that's part of the sacrifice, which I'm prepared to make. You know, because this is what I want. This is what I wanted to do. A lot of people who are very driven, sometimes it can come from an insecurity, a chip on the shoulder, a point to prove. 
I don't get that sense with you, Joel. I get a sense of it's all about the music and it's all about the passion. But am I right? Correct me if I'm not. <laughs> um, Have you ever wanted to prove anyone wrong? Has that ever been part of your motivation? I guess, um, you know, my journey from what I've done over the years to where I am now, um, you know, maybe being involved in, you know, the reality TV stuff and um, doing stuff outside of music, mm -hmm. maybe did light a fire in my belly that I did want to prove people wrong. Because there was a bit of a stigma around that stuff. You know, don't get me wrong, I had the best time of my life doing that and it was an amazing experience and I would never change anything. You know, I'm so grateful that I got to do those things. But it definitely did throw some hurdles up for me in the music industry right. um, that I had to overcome. And there was people that maybe would have turned their nose up a little bit, um, but that I think made me even more driven and maybe it was a bit more like, I'll prove them wrong, you know? Okay, you know, um, I'll, I'll have to work a bit harder. Right. Um, you know, I'll have to get the music a bit better. Okay. Um, until it's undeniable, until they can't... You so, can't be ignored anymore. Can't be like, ignored. I was going to ask you about Geordie Shaw because how, how, much, how much influential was that on your later career? It sounds as though it didn't open any doors. If anything, it closed them. Um, I wouldn't say that's true. I would say, um, you know, being on a reality TV show that was so big um, definitely uh, gave me a profile where I could then promote myself as okay. a DJ. Um, so, you know, obviously with social media and um, just generally, you know, kind of being in, a, in, a, in the public eye a little bit. Um, I then, as a DJ, could reach more people with my brand, you right. know, and I was, I was DJing all around the UK um, after doing that, playing in clubs all around the UK, uh, sometimes not the best clubs, <laughs> but I was still playing in front of more people, which is all I wanted to do. So it gave you a profile and it gave you the audience, but what about in terms of the record industry? Yeah, so that, there was hurdles. Um, you know, I know that, for example, you know, when I first was having my first hit, you know, some radios were not sure whether to play it or not, you know. Okay. Um, it's just totally understandable, you know. It's, I know there is a bit of a stigma attached to it. But as I said to you, you know, I always kept a positive attitude. And in my mind, I was like, um, I've just got to work that bit harder. And I've just got to make sure the music is good enough that it is undeniable. Um, so, yeah, I would say there was a few hurdles that were put up. But I was, to me, it was just more of a challenge then to overcome that. Yeah. We've talked a lot about how you've had to graft and, and grind away. Let's talk now about the success, right? Because <laughs> you and I have spoken before about this, how you're almost glad that you got success when you did, a little mm. bit older. Can you tell me why you're glad you had to go through that process yeah. and, and maybe you weren't an overnight success, you really did have to earn it? It's honestly the biggest blessing ever. Right. Why, why, why is that? Because when it happened, I was ready. I was ready for it, man. <laughs> I, I remember, um, you know, summer 2019, I call it the summer of sorry. <laughs> um, it was the summer that my life changed forever. It was, you know, even when I think about it now, it gives me goosebumps. Um, it was magical. Did you get a sense it was coming? Was, it, was there a gradual build up or was it more of a boom moment? Um, so I released Sorry with uh, a label called Perfect Havoc, who are an independent record label. And I'd done a few tracks with them before. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this is like the third record that we've done together. And, you know, the previous ones, um, I'd been like building blocks, you know, okay. I've got, with the other tracks before, you know, I've got my first Radio One play, you know, um, got my first sort of New Music Friday on Spotify with the previous songs and then Sorry came. And at the, at the start, it was very slow. Like there was no, it didn't rock it. Right. You know, we released that song in April, 2019. It didn't become a hit until June. So there was three months where I was just doing anything to get that song played on radio, you know, DJs to play it, you know, doing anything I could just to hustle it. Was there a sense of in inevitability that it was going to happen or not? Would no. you do it all on, you knew it was all no, on No, I was you. already working on the next one. Right. Okay. I never, you know, again, at that point, it was still like such a massive dream by the hit record. <laughs> I was like, right, onto the next one, let's keep going. So, you know, I had Sorry out and at the time, um, I was a, um, I had a show on KISS FM. Mm -hmm. And that, that was, you know, having my show on KISS every week was a big step for me, actually. I'd, I'd secured that show the previous year um, and I had a good relationship with KISS. And um, Andy Roberts, who was um, running KISS at that time, I remember actually, I was, uh, I was DJing 
out in Ocean Beach here in Ibiza for a history event. And Andy was there. Right. And um, this was like early June. And um, I remember having a conversation and I was like, oh, do you like the new, the new one, sorry? You know, um, it's always a bit of an awkward conversation, you know. You, you kind of feel like you're asking for a favor right, to you know, yeah. give it a spin. He was like, you know what, I like this one. I'm going to playlist it. And I was like, what, Kiss playlist? I'm going to give it a go. And I remember, I was like, thank you so much. I like, shook his hand and I got on the phone straight away um, to one of the guys that run the record label. That was, and I was like, mate. I've just got Kiss playlist for us. Like, this is a big thing, you know, because that's daily rotation. Did you feel song. like you're walking on air almost at that yeah, point? Yeah, I remember being in Ibiza Airport. Like, my body was like feeling fuzzy. Like, just thinking, oh my God, I've got my first Amazing. radio daytime playlist. It's a huge deal. And then, sorry, the following week, started getting paid on Kiss during the day, every day. And then, and then we started getting the sniffs from the major record labels. Is that where it began to yeah, snowball? Yeah, that's where it began to okay. snowball then. Because once you've got a song that's like, on daytime radio playlist, it starts hitting the Shazam chart. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, as I said, the major record labels started sniffing about. And then like, I was getting calls every day going, oh my God, like, you know, this label, they rang us, they might want it, they're offering this money to sign it, this money. And then, and then it really started going. We ended up signing Sorry to Atlantic Records. So at that point, Sorry became up license to a major record label. Okay. So then at that point, you know, with a major record label, it's like a big engine. You suddenly get the big engine behind the, the track, rocket fuel behind the it. rocket fuel behind it. And that's when things changed. There was a big moment um, that summer when Love Island was at this point huge. Like it still is obviously, yeah, but at yeah, that yeah. point it was like- It was everywhere. Yeah. And if your song got played on Love Island, it was quite a big deal. And I think it was the Love Island final and um, Sorry got played on the Love Island final and they played like a full two minutes of it. They used it for like the whole montage and boom, it went straight to number one on Shazam in the UK and it actually broke the record for the most Shazam song ever in the UK in 24 hours. When did you know that they were going to play it? How much? We, you don't know. You had no, you, idea, no idea at all. I was actually, so it just blew up. Yeah, I was out in Zanti at the time. <laughs> I had a residency out there. And I remember, I've, I've told this story before, but like, you know, Phone services and it is terrible. Right. Like, they've got like no 4G or whatever. It's just awful. Yeah. And I remember I was in my um, hotel room and um, getting ready for the gig, and and the play happened on on Love Island, and my phone just like froze. Like it was like, like loads of things going off, and uh, and the first thing I thought was like, oh, what have I done? Something's <laughs> happened. Like something's come out about me. Like you know this moment of fear. Like, um, but yeah, obviously when I realised you know what had happened, I was like, wow, that's huge. And then I saw the Shazam chart and we were number one. And I was like, okay, this is big. And then the next day we got the stat through that, oh my God, that was the most Shazam song ever in the UK and then broke this record. And then Shazam started twi like posting about it and then it, that got a bit and of attention. We, I mean, at that point we was already off, like it, it already moving through the charts, but that was a big moment for us that summer. And um, yeah, like, sorry, flu man, it, it, you know, it became a top 40. And I remember going, oh my God, I've got a top 40 record. My dreams come true, I've done it. And it was like, it's going top 20 and it's going top 10. And I was just like, you know, every week it was like building and building. Yeah, yeah. And at that time I was out in the sun doing my residencies. I was playing in Zanny, Mali and Magaloo, Odd Gig and Ibiza, playing the record. And it was the biggest song of the summer. Everyone was going crazy to it. And mate, imagine I've been a DJ on these resorts for years. Yeah, 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 and I've always yeah. been playing other people's music. And suddenly I'm DJing and it's my song <laughs> that's getting the biggest reaction. You know, this is anything I ever wanted. And it just must have been wild. It must have blown your mind, right? It, it blew my mind, man. And like I said, I always look back on that summer with, you know, it was so special to me because... I know the answer to this question already because you've not stopped smiling while talking about <laughs> it, right? But a lot of people, when they chase a goal or a dream and work 10, 15 years towards it, there's an anticlimax when it finally happens because it doesn't live up to how you <laughs> built it in your head. Was that ever the case? Has there ever been an anticlimactic moment after that summer or...? Absolutely not. No, no, you know, I've, as I've always, you know, it's the last few years, man, have been an absolute roller coaster. It feels like things have gone from strength to strength. And there is obviously, you know, there's a lot of pressure music industry, um, which I've learned to deal with. And there's the ups and downs, and sometimes things don't go right. And those moments are tough. Um, well, surely the biggest moment, Joel, like you've made it, you've had that enormous summer and then COVID. Yeah. So everything stops. There's, there's no gigs, there's no travel. Did you feel like, I can't believe I finally made it and now the world has changed? Was there a sense of like this, 
this isn't right, what do I do about it? Yeah, I mean, that was crazy time because, um, so at this point, you know, like, I was on to the next record, which was Lonely. And um, now that was my follow-up to Sorry. And Lonely is a top 10 as well. So I just had back-to-back -back top 10s. And um, at the time I was on tour supporting Jax Jones. Um, and I had this, this is like back in like January, February, 2020. Yeah. And I had the whole year planned out with these big festivals. Because every, everyone must have gigs. wanted a piece of you, right? Yeah, yeah, like, you know, and you know, I had an agent that had come on board and was booking these huge gigs that I'd always dreamed of playing. And I was like, oh my God, like this is going to be the biggest year of my life. I just had two big hit records and then boom, COVID hits, everything canceled. <laughs> and I'm back in my bungalow going, no, like why? Like, surely not. Just as I'm about to go and do all these big tours did and you festivals. Think you'd, you'd got a glimpse and then it was gone. Yeah, I did. I did. I did. And, and um, it was, I uh, listen, mate, a lot, other people went for a lot harder than I did. Like, you know, I was in a great position still. Um, but just for me as a DJ. Sure, it's all relative, though. Yeah, right? sure, you're, it's you're all relative. Like, to, to feel I, sad I, or... I, I felt really sad, mate, because I just, you know, gigs were just getting cancelled so in front of my do? eyes. So, talk me through how you got through that period. Um, Looking back on it now, um, you know, I had to accept that the stuff was kept getting cancelled. Always had that glimmer of hope of this is only going to be a short term yeah, thing. Weeks, it's going to come weeks. back. I'd still have my summer. Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. I was still booking gigs for the summer. Going, It'll be right by then. You know, <laughs> this is just going to be a three month thing. Or five. Um, and at the time as well, um, I was working on my track Head and Heart and um, everything stopped. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to focus in the studio on the next records and get my music ready. So when it comes back, you know, I've got even more bangers coming. Is that the most important thing? Because I guess that you could have had that maybe self doubt that, you know, I was the flavor of that summer, but now the world is going to change so much and people might think of me as 2019. Or were you so confident that you could continue delivering the music that you, yeah. what, now you had that platform, you were just going to build from it? Was yeah, it I, I feel like I was in a good place um, with good momentum and yeah. I was like, Things were just clicking in the studio, the music was working, and you know, I was working on other demos that felt really strong, like Head and Heart. So I was like, I've got more to come, like I can keep going with this, you know. Um, so I don't think I ever doubted that I would, you know, lose my momentum musically. Because okay. I, I had some stuff that I was working on that I felt confident in. Um, now looking back now on that time period, it was actually a blessing for me. Okay. Because um I would have gone out and toured the hell out of 2020. I, you know, like we said earlier, I say yes to everything because <laughs> I love DJing. Yeah. I want to be in front of people. So I was saying yes to every single gig that was coming in for that year. I was like, I try to get on the road, DJ in front of everyone. Um, but with those gigs getting canceled, it meant that I had actually stopped gigging and really focus in on the music. And, uh, and that's when I made Head and Heart. And that's, you know, be my biggest ever record. My so you almost global, needed yeah. the time for yeah, that. Yeah, to focus. Were you worried about, would you have just burnt out, do you think? Would you have just gone yeah. so, so hard? I've learned the lesson since COVID that, you know, balancing touring and music is a difficult thing to do. Like last year, I definitely feel like I over toured. Okay. I mean, I think I did nearly 200 gigs last year. Jeez. And that's global as well. That's, that's America and back yeah. and around Europe and, you know, um, and it's hard to be touring that much and get the music to the level it needs to be at as well. Because something's always got to give, Yeah, right? something's got to give. And that's why this year I'm still touring like absolute crazy, but I'm aware that I need to also have as much time as I can possibly to work on the music and get it to the level it needs to be at. So um, looking back on the COVID time, having to come away from mm. touring at a pivotal point in my career where I've just had two back-to-back -back hits. You know, because you can have two hits and then fade away, man. You need to, to cement yourself in this industry, you need to like have a lot of hits. Yeah, you <laughs> um, keep them coming. You got to keep them coming, man, um, because people move on quickly. So do you feel a lot of pressure now you've reached the platform you have to keep delivering? Because I imagine, inspiration and creativity too much pressure will just kill the creativity so how do you manage that pressure to perform the pressure to keep the hits coming you're such a laid-back guy it seems <laughs> you don't 
you don't really have that, but yeah, is no, that no, a problem? I, no, I definitely do. Uh, maybe people don't see that, but um, you know, I really do feel the pressure. Um, it's a very competitive industry and music is always changing as well. So what I was doing a few years ago is not going to work now. So I need to go with the trends and almost be in front of the trends as well of what I'm doing. And it's very difficult, man. That's why people like Calvin Harris, you know, Geta, Tiesto, when I look at their careers, I'm like, they're amazing, they're gods. Because they've stayed at the top of the game for decades. Yeah. You know, look at Calvin Harris now. I mean, like, um, a genius, man. He keeps reinventing and able to just stay ahead of the curve of his music. And that's so inspirational to me. And, and I need to, um, you know, when I come with fresh music, it, it needs to, it needs to work, it needs to be relevant, man, and, and it's a difficult thing to do. So how does the pressure affect you? It affects everyone in different ways, right? It could be sleepless nights or yeah. killing that creativity. Yeah. How, how does it affect you and how do you deal uh, with oh, it? Oh, there's definitely sleepless nights, <laughs> you know, and it, it's on my mind 24-7. And I think, I think this is why, uh, I mean, I, I only can talk for myself, but it, this, this I, it's not a job, it's my life, I call it. It's not a job, it's my life. There's, there's no, there's nothing outside of it. There's mm -hmm. no separation. This is everything. It's on my mind 24 seven, every single day of the week. There's no like, okay, uh, work's over today. You know, I'm not thinking about it. It's always on my mind, you know, uh, that constant pressure, uh, thinking of, you know, what I need to do, what I need to work on, how I can make things better. What's the next move? It's constant, man. Um, so you're worried about burning out? I not, guess your management team are, but... Uh, yeah, what, my what, management team are definitely worried. What, what <laughs> They're about definitely you, though? Worried. Do, do, are you able to identify when maybe things are getting a bit too much and take it, take it the, the gas, the foot off the gas? How, how do you manage that? I'm, I'm okay with it. And I won't take my foot off the gas because I feel like if I do, that's when I might slip. Okay. Um, and I heard a, a quote um, on a podcast recently, I'm sure you've heard this one, but it was the first time I heard it, but it really struck home to me and it was, it was pressure as a privilege. And when I heard that, it really hit yeah, home yeah, to yeah. me because I do always feel this pressure, but it's a privilege that I get to feel this pressure because I've worked my whole life to be in this position, to, to have this pressure on me, it's what I always wanted. And it's the reality of the industry and trying to stay at the top of it. So, you know, um, I think there's moments in a day where I have to, check myself and take a deep breath uh, when things are getting really intense and really crazy is you know you've got this bro like and kind of have a little word with myself and and you know I, d I do that during the day sometimes um you know maybe there is there is ways that I can you know work out that I can cope with things better that I haven't found yet um maybe that that is something that I need to so, so it sounds like something you're open to, though, like finding yeah, new I, ways of, of working yeah, or recovering so. or whatever it might yeah, be. Yeah, you know, and, and um, you know, maybe take, you know, scheduling in the diary, maybe a few days off here and there is what I need to do, which I don't, because <laughs> <laughs> there's no days off at the moment and there never is. Uh, but maybe that's something that I need to look at doing. But overall, you know, this is what I've chosen to do. And, um, I'm, I'm, I'm here for it, man. You've mentioned, <laughs> now, what, what, is, what is next? What is your ultimate ambition and what do you want your legacy to be? You mentioned a couple of huge names there in, in, in the music industry. Where do you get your inspiration from? Is it from the likes of Calvin Harris or David Guetta or, or do you look outside to other industries of people who are excelling for yeah. motivation or inspiration? Yeah, you know, there's a few people that, um, you know, I'd say people even like, um, obviously in the DJ world, we've mentioned a few of them, like you said, uh, you know, their careers are so inspirational to me. And, you know, outside of music, people like The Rock and, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo, you know, these people are winners. And uh, I definitely, you know, watch some of their stuff online and even uh, I'm a big fan of Gordon Ramsay, you know. Right, okay. But, you know, just people that have got that mentality to win. It's like relentlessness it's, almost. Yeah. And um, I definitely like get inspiration from people outside of music and just people that have really got that will to win and um, have been successful in their own right. Um, so yeah. What's the, what's the goal then? What's the what's ambition? The what's the goal? You, you've ticked off so many things that you wanted to do. <laughs> what's still on your, on your bucket list of things you want to achieve? I mean, 
There's like short term goals, like for example, this year my album's coming out, which I've been working relentlessly to pull together. That's going to be coming out at the end of September, start of October. Are you happy with where everything is? Yes, um, I'm happy with everything is, you know, obviously. Are you someone, sorry to jump in, but are you someone who's never quite happy? It's just, there's just a day when it's got to be done by. Or Correct. can you go, do you know what? It's done, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> there's rare occasions <laughs> where I will be like, I'm happy 100%. Um, but yeah, normally I always feel like it's just a I can add a bit about. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just got to be done. And yeah, then... yeah. So you know, the album is coming this year, which is going to be a big moment for me. You know, the last five years of my life and my work is going to kind of come together in a body of work which I'm going to present, and I can't wait to um, you know announce that and get that out. And I'm going to be really proud of that body of work, and um, it's going to be a big moment for me. So this year, it's all about the album, the music, and then um, I well, mean longer term plans you know i just want to keep doing what i'm doing man i want to grow my brand to a big global dj brand um and there's work to do you know there's there's areas of the world that i haven't played in i haven't been to south america yet i haven't really played a lot in asia i've done a few gigs um it's a big world out there yeah and i want to i want to have that global recognized dj brand like 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 we said like calvin like tiesto like getter I want to get myself there, you know. How confident are you it's going to happen? It's going to happen. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. But no, I had to no, ask not, the question anyway. No, no, no. It's, it's, a, a, it's, it's not a, in a cocky way. I don't, no, I don't mean it like that. But it, in my mind, I don't think it's an arrogance. I have it's to, a confidence. I, I right? have to believe it's going to happen. Because if you don't, if you don't believe it's going to happen, who is man? Are you going to set a time frame on it, or are you just going to do, you know, one Never season, one year? At a Never time. set a time frame, man. You can't do that because you'll only be disappointed, probably. Um, but. You gotta believe that it's gonna happen, of course, bro. You said to me before that it never feels like work. Is that, do you think that's always gonna be the case? Or if at a point it does begin to feel like work, is that when you're gonna think about doing something else? I don't think it'll ever feel like work. It's, it's my passion. And, it, and listen, I still get more excited today about a gig, you know, the same excitement I felt when I was 14 years old playing at the pub. <laughs> I still feel that buzz. You and never have to like, dial it up. You're always ready to go. You can always give 100%. Yes, always. And um, that's how I know that, you know, I am doing what I was meant to do. I'm living my dream and it's not going to stop. What about the downsides? We've talked about all the highs. Obviously, you travel so much. And I want to talk to you about how you deal with that. But what about the sacrifices, the, the romantic relationships, mm. your family relationships? Mm -hmm. How do you juggle all of that? Yeah, that's, it, that's tricky. You know, that's definitely the biggest sacrifice. I mean, I've, I've been single now for six years and there's there's no space in my life to have a relationship. And you okay with that? Because um, a lot of people wouldn't be happy to, to put that all to one side. I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything. Okay. You know, I, I, I am so committed to this career, to, to what I'm doing that, like, I don't feel like I'm, I need it. I don't feel like I'm missing it, you know. Um, I'm happy doing what I'm doing and I don't almost want a distraction. Okay. Um, you know, what, to do what I want to do, it takes so much focus that I don't want anything to get in the way of it. Right. You know, I know that I have to stay so, you know, uh, have that tunnel vision, that laser focus to make this happen. And you think a relationship would, would distract from that? It wouldn't enhance what you're doing? I don't. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, a relationship is, it, you know, it takes work. You know, yeah. I've been in them before, and you know, my my life is very selfish. Um, so I'm always on the road. You know, I'm in a different country nearly every day. I'm on a flight nearly every day. You know, and my my time is consumed with the music I'm making and the sets I'm preparing and my and. How, how would I ever dedicate any more time to give someone love? Is I, that because you're not, you can't fully commit to someone now, that's why you're not doing it? Yeah. Because think, you just don't have the time or the resource available? Exactly, yeah, exactly. Are you worried that there might come a time where maybe it's it's too late? Uh, are you confident that you are going to uh, find someone when the time suits you? Yeah, I mean, my mum always says this. She's like, Joe, when are you going to settle down? And I'm like, never, yeah, how am I going to do it? I'm going on tour. <laughs> but I'm just, I'm just interested, Joel, because you're yeah. talking about how like this is your life and this is what you yeah. always want to do. Yeah. How are your relationships, you know, specifically a romantic relationship yeah. or maybe a family with kids, how's that all going to fit into it if you're never going to stop doing what you do? I know, I know. I don't have an answer for that. Do you, is it something you juggle with? I, it does creep in my mind every now and again because obviously, like, I do want to have a family, you know, like, yeah. anyone does, like, of course I do. Um, but at the same time, 
I need, I know I need to stay so focused on what I'm doing and it's not something that I can explore right now. I need, I need to, you know, there's so many more goals and things I want to achieve in this career that I'm doing um, that there isn't room for it. It's not, not kind of like a, a career ambition you've got, like once you've ticked off, maybe you can have a couple of years downtime or slow things down a little bit. You're not thinking like that yet. I mean, potentially that, that could happen, you know. I think, um, I think I always have this fear as well as like, I don't want to lose what I've got. Right. Because I've waited and worked so hard to get it that now I'm here, I'm like, I have to stay 100%. You're like I'm, a shark, you've got to keep swimming. You yeah. don't want to stop, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, and you know, um, but maybe, you know, after like years of doing this more and more, I might feel a bit more like, all right, I'm, 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 I'm cemented. You'll know when the time comes. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. So, um, but right now, it's definitely like 100% focus on what I'm doing, and 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 look in the future, who knows what's going to happen, right? Nice Thank you. Enjoy our beef. See you Thank later. You. <laughs> you travel the world at the moment, right? How many how many gigs are you doing this year? Oh God. Um, I'd say this year probably around 160. Right, and that's it's all over the world, right? You're in yeah. North America and you're in Europe. Yeah. How do you cope with such a huge amount of travel? I mean, the late nights, how on earth do you kind of navigate such a difficult time, time frame? It's definitely the most difficult part of what I do. Um, and I have to try and stay in my routine as much as possible. And that's how I keep balanced, okay. and keep a clear and straight head. Is it really hard having a routine though when you are constantly on the move? Very difficult, it's a, it's a huge challenge. Um, you know, sometimes I'll be so jet lagged and it'll be some crazy time in the morning, but I'll still drag myself to the gym, right. get my workout in, right. um, you know, still keep my food healthy um, and just try and always, you know, have that checklist of myself and tick those boxes and keeping that routine as much as I can wherever I am in the world. Also, you know, I don't party much, you know, once in a blue moon. So even though like it might look like, you know, on social media that, you know, DJ in here, there and the party guy, the truth is, mate, after gigs, I'm normally back in the hotel in a bubble bath watching Dragon's Den. You know what I mean? It's, it's so the that's how you unwind. Well, after playing to however many thousands of people, you're going home and watching the Dragons. Yeah, I love a bit of Dragon's Den. Love a bit of a Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares. I've been it's, watching a lot of those episodes. I mean, recently. you just think you'd want something slightly less adrenaline fueled than like Gordon Ramsay shouting at someone or people getting their business dream destroyed. I'll be watching like a fishing show or something just completely chill. Maybe, but, I'll, maybe I'll give that a go. <laughs> you know, when people think of DJs, I, I think a lot of people will think of the travel, think of the jet set lifestyle, partying the whole time. Obviously, no one really looks like you in your industry. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about bodybuilding and fitness modeling. How did what you went through in terms of contest prep, prep prepare you for everything you're doing? Because it's probably the hardest thing that most people do, mm. getting properly lean. I mean, talking like mm -hmm. for a stage. Can you talk to me about how those early experiences of bodybuilding have stood you in such good stead for your hectic lifestyle now? Yeah, honestly, it was such a benefit to me, benefit for me to go through that process doing those competitions because, like you said, it is the hardest thing I'll ever do. Right. Um, you know, dieting like that, almost starving while training, while working. Because it's a 24 hour commitment then. Yeah, right? yeah. You, you, you it, can't switch off from that. And those, pre those preps, you know, for the competitions, they'd go on for like, four or five months yeah um and they made me so mentally strong that anything else will never be harder than that so going back to what you just asked about touring of like how do i do it you know how can i fly around these many countries and you know do these many gigs um with this crazy schedule i think the resilience comes a lot from doing those fitness competitions for that many years right where nothing will ever be as hard as that um, and going through that, it's almost like scarred me. <laughs> you know, scarred but me. in a positive way. In a positive way. <laughs> in a positive way. So I, I look back on that whole era of my life when I was doing the bodybuilding and the fitness as a huge, huge, um, you know, positive thing for me that I've used later in my life um, in my music career and the music industry. Um, that sort of like mental strength and resilience coming from doing those competitions has, has helped me for sure. So many people that get into amazing shape or have to diet very, very hard to, to get to a certain body fat percentage. It's very easy to get caught up in kind of like body the small feel or any kind mm. of eating, disordered eating behavior. Was that any, anything you ever experienced or dealt with? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, probably would say I 
have body dysmorphia to some extent, you know. I think a lot of people that do those fitness competitions probably do, you know. It's part of what drives you, right? It's kind of like the hidden side of it though, because everyone yeah. sees the pictures of people looking absolutely amazing. And I've seen your image and you're still in great shape. <laughs> do you look at yourself now and still think, oh, I'm not quite happy with how I look? Or is that something as you've got older, you've been able to get a bit more perspective? Right? Yeah, I think as I got older, I got more perspective of it. But maybe in my earlier years, I did always think like, oh, you know, you know, I need to look that better. That bit bigger, yeah, that bit leaner. Bit, yeah, exactly. But like I said, I think that's part of what drives people that do those fitness competitions. Um, but yeah, I mean... Um, what about the eating side of it? Because yeah. when, you're, when you're counting calories, it can completely mess up your relationship with food. Did yeah. you ever experience that? Yes, I did. And you know, um, especially the first couple of times I did the fitness competitions, you know, when it came to like cheat day, I'd always binge and, you know, have these huge binges. And right. after the competition, I'd have these rebounds that were terrible. and gain weight and you know it'll be messed up and it definitely has affected my relationship with food um, but as I've got older I've definitely got control of that. Do you still um, have to work on it? Do you still have to kind of remind yourself that you're, you're eating because you need the food and it's not all about body fat percentage or whatever? I think how it is now is that because I've done it for so many years you know mm. I, I I'm quite strict to my food um, and I'm, I'm happy to do that. Like, it's not like I'm unhappy, you know, eating my diet. Yeah. Um, that's just part of my lifestyle. Um, but going back sort of maybe 10 years when I was doing those competitions, it, yeah, it was a bit, it, it, you know, especially post competition, like I said, I'd go out and just eat everything and be binging. And then, and then I'd go back into the competitions and go on a really restricted uh, diet. And it was very and sort of yo-yo. Right? Yeah, it was very yo-yo, um, but now, I feel like I've, you know, it's very balanced. And, um, you know, I still go out and enjoy a meal here and there. And, you know, you know, I'm not that strict when I did the competitions, but I eat more now just to like, keep myself feeling good. And when I'm on the road moving around, I'll eat healthy and avoid like junk food and that sort of thing. Um, but every now and again, go for a treat or go out for dinner, it's fine. Okay. When you look back at that period, obviously it did an enormous amount for your career in terms of your, your resilience and your work ethic. Can you look back on that period of, of fitness modeling and, and physique competition? Were you happy? If you're now looking appraising <laughs> that time because I, the reason I ask, so many yeah. people look back when they're in the shape of their lives, but they admit to me they weren't happy at the time because it was all consuming or they weren't happy with, your, with their body. Do you look back at that period fondly or is it something where you realize if you're honest, you probably weren't that happy in yourself? No, I would look back on it fondly. Um, for me, it was very competition driven. Um, you know, I was obsessed with wanting to get as shredded as possible. So you in when you say competition, were you in competition with yourself in, in terms of how lean you could get or did you want to be the best on stage? I wanted to be the best. Okay. I wanted to be the best man. And I was like, um, even though I didn't really have like the best genetics, you know, well, there was people that had better genetics than me. I just believed I could always outwork them. Right. Because I had this obsession in my mind. <laughs> I was like, well, listen, you might have better genetics or whatever, but you are not going to work harder than me. Um, and you know, I, I did well in those competitions, you know, and obviously I, there was a point where I was like, right, I'm going to put this on the back burner now and focus on my music. Um, I kind of achieved everything I wanted to in the fitness stuff. I, I did those physique competitions and the fitness competitions. Um, you know, I won a few of them and eventually, you know, my dream was always to get on the front cover of Muscle and Fitness and I got it. You know, and I feel like once I got that sort of front cover on Muscle and Fitness UK, that was end game for me. Right. And I was like, I got what I wanted out of this, you know. Um, you know, fitness to me now is, is like a hobby. You know, it's just part of my lifestyle. It's not like, you know, I'm, I'm not training for a certain, you know, competitional moment like I was back then. Well, has it transitioned? Because I think for a lot of people, the, the training and the nutrition is all about physique. And then as you get a little bit older or maybe something happens, it's much more about a mental health benefit. Uh, it anchors your day. Is that something uh, that resonates with 100%, you? hundred percent now, it's much more of a mental thing, okay. you know. Um, whereas back four, it was definitely more, you know, physical thing and I want to look the best and be the best on stage and win the competitions. Now it's just, it keeps me feeling balanced in life and keeps me healthy and going back to that, staying in my routine and ticking those boxes. Is that even more important when you travel? Because I know Dwayne Johnson said, but wherever he is in the world, he gets his work out because that kind of anchors his day. Can yes. you, can you that, identify with that sentiment? Yep, that's exactly what it is. So okay. that, that workout for me, um, going back to me having my daily routine, wherever I am in the world, it's my anchor. So I get in the gym, you know, do my workout, um, do my cardio, come out of the gym, I'm like, right, box ticked. Let, what's the other tasks I've got to do today? And it's all anchored back to that workout as 
as the first part of ticking those boxes for the day and you know staying productive staying on my flow um even sometimes when i feel so tired and i'm jet lagged and i'm literally dragging myself to the nearest gym in some <laughs> state in america when i come out of there i feel like a new man right i'm like right i'm ready like it's such an, a, a mad thing what exercise does to me mentally and i remember back when when covid hit and you know the thing that hurt me most was when all the gyms closed and um but <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's joe give away i mean it's definitely, it's definitely not me they're trying to get the attention of <laughs> but yeah we, i think a lot of people found that like you get your routine you train covid hit all the gyms closed yeah. i mean how did you that, get through that period that was a really difficult thing for me you know i remember ordering weird gym equipment Everyone was Amazon, to Amazon, weren't scrambling they? Yeah. to get stuff and doing these home workouts <laughs> and yeah you know um that was that was tough man um, that really hit me actually and that's when i realized how important the gym and exercise was to me mentally that's when i really realized it's taken when it got taken away i was like is, yeah. all i want to do is get my workout in right i was like that became like the thing for me, I was like, I've got to figure out how to do this. And when you're training, is it like you're almost in a meditative state or do you yeah. find you're quite creative in that space? Because a lot of people have different experiences of when they're training. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I find um, when I'm in the gym, everything in my brain is firing. Okay. So I'm actually like in between sets, making notes on my phone. Okay. Uh, the things that I need to do, um, you know, things that I could be doing better, um, ideas that I've got, when I'm in the gym working out, it's all triggering. So it's actually almost like a conduit for your creativity or inspiration. It helps you kind of get your thought process into order. Yeah, 100%. And, and um, even when I'm in the gym training, people go, what music do you listen to? I actually listen to music that I'm working on. Okay. Because when I'm in the gym and I'm working out, it's almost like you're not focusing too much you know, on the actual track. It's kind of just like reference listening. Okay. I find it a really good way for me to identify things that need to be fixed on the Almost track. more on a subconscious level rather yeah, yeah. than directly And then I'm attention. making notes like, oh, I'll take this hi-hat away or add a snare <laughs> right, roll okay. here or whatever. It's mad. And then I go to the studio and, you know, apply those notes. But a lot of it comes from listening to it when I'm working out. So it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's a real big thing for me, man. The thing is though, Joel, that's your training. That for a lot of people is kind of their downtime. You've just described it as that's just more work. <laughs> so what, how do you switch off? You know, you, you've joked about watching Dragon's Den after, after a gig, but what are you doing for meaningful kind of R&R &R to properly recharge the batteries? I don't. Ever? Ever. I don't. I'll be honest with you, man. It's, I, I'm not going to make something up. I, I, I don't switch off. I literally, I don't have, I just don't. It's, right. it's constant, man. From the moment I wake up to the moment I go to bed, I'm in the zone. Do you think your brain's wired differently then? Because a lot of people <laughs> just couldn't do it. And I, I, I don't mean that in a kind of facetious way. I'm genuinely yeah. interested. Do you think that you are just operating kind of, I don't know, on a different plane to, 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 to other people? I mean, maybe, I, I don't know. I, I know sometimes like, when I've been at home, my family have gone like, what's wrong with you? So and yeah, I'm like, oh, pay me a picture then. It's Christmas day, right? You've got a few <laughs> days off. What are you doing? You, you can't be working then. You must be able to kind of switch off a little bit. Yeah, do you know what? Sometimes, you know, in moments like that, when it is like Christmas and you've got family around or, you know, I make a conscious effort to, you know, be, be present for them and not be off in my head thinking right. about what I need to do. Is that something like... you struggle with though? Like, because being, being present is so important and being connected to people is so important for, for mental health and just quality of life. Is that something you have struggled with or are struggling with? Um, I do try and check myself regularly to be present. Okay. Um, I think it's important to uh, be in the moment at times, especially big moments of my life, you know. Um, because you want to appreciate it, well, right? You want, you, want to... you want to appreciate it. And I definitely, in moments, I'm like, Joel, you're about to walk on the main stage of Tomorrowland. Come on, mate. Do you know what I mean? Are I'm you like, literally talking to yourself yes. like that? You're literally having I'm that having conversation. I'm having a conversation in my head. Nice. Um, and it's important to do that. And um, yeah, I mean, and you mentioned like when I'm around family or, you know, other people and it's kind of their time, definitely to make the effort to be present with them. And I mean, in past relationships, like, maybe my relationship I have struggled because I'll be sitting there not present and I'll be thinking and, and it, you know, I'm thinking about 
what work I need to do and, and, and then that can affect has that been the main, quality time, you know. Has that been the main kind of bone of contention you've had in relationships is that people may feel that you're not giving them enough of yourself, you're not giving them enough time. Is that a common theme? Yeah, I think I, I would agree to that. Um, I would say that like, you know, that's definitely, it goes back to that thing of just like, with what I wanted to do, I, I knew how much I had to focus on it right. in almost a selfish way. Um, that it's hard to then give someone, you know, your full attention and, because the relationships are work, right? Yeah. You've got to give back. It's not all give, give. And a so. lot of people, it's 50-50. You've, got, yeah, you've yeah. got to be there for someone and, and give and, and take. Do you think you can be incredibly successful without being selfish? <sighs> I, I would probably say no. I would say in most industries, I mean, you think of like sports stars yeah. and athletes. I mean, you know, I'm sure like they've dedicated their whole life to get to the top of their games, you know, and, and it is a selfish thing to do. I mean, like, obviously I, I can't speak for anyone but myself, but for me to have got to where I've got to, I've had to really kind of like be selfish and be almost isolated right. to, um, to just to commit that much amount of time to do what I needed to do. And have your family always been supportive of that? Because when you have one family member who is incredibly driven or selfish, or however you want to phrase <laughs> it, it can often cause friction because maybe someone else isn't getting as much attention or they don't feel like they're getting much from you. You know, do you need your family to understand that? Have they always understood oh. that? And what about your friendship group as well? You must have to have certain types of friends that are stuck with you who, who can accept you for all of your all of your positives <laughs> and all of your flaws maybe a hundred percent like my first of all my family are, are my absolute rock um they know me inside out um they know what i'm like right. and they and they have seen me go through all the ups and downs on this journey and, they, and they've been there through thick and thin for me you and know, they my, celebrate your successes as well I, it's a joint effort a hundred percent and you know i include them as much as i can like I booked my mum holiday to come out to Ibiza next week. Nice. And I did last year as well. So, you know, um, my sister's just come to New York for me this weekend. I've booked her tickets to come. Um, you know, when, when I got nominated for a Brit Award, you know, I booked them a suite at, at, at the O2. So, you know, whenever I have something going on, I'll make sure they're included to experience it with me. Nice. Because I feel like, you know, I, I don't really spend my money on anything, you know what I mean? So I'd rather spend it on them to give them great experiences and, and have them with me. And I can That's imagine what you makes me happy. all the success in the world, but if there's no one there to share it with, you probably have to question <laughs> whether or not it was worth it, right? Yeah. It's all about having that, that sense of community and, and shared celebration. I've got, and, and I've got a few, like I said, I've got like a, a very small circle of really good mates. And again, you know, I, they were out in Ibiza a few weeks ago. I, you know, I got their flights and, they stayed with me and, you know, I arranged the whole week for them so they could have a great experience. So, yeah, they probably have to put up with me being the way I am. I mean, it sounds but I like, try to give back as well. It like, sounds like there's more than a few perks, though, to be honest, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm, not, I'm sure they're not complaining well, now. Well, listen, there is now, do you know what I mean? Because, because the success has come and there is perks and there's these amazing experiences where, you know, they can come with me all over the world and, you know, the, the red carpet's rolled out, I make sure it's all great for them. And they have these amazing experiences and I'm able to give that to them now because it's, it's here, it's happening. Yeah. So we have this conversation in 20, 30 years time, we're looking back at your career. What would you define as success? What are you gonna look back on and go, do you know what, I absolutely nailed that, I aced it. <laughs> wow, that's a big question. And I don't think I've got the answer for you. I don't think I've got the answer for you, but. Is that because you're just, you're just gonna go with the flow? You're just gonna try and say yes to things and eke out opportunities and, and, yeah. and seize things when they present themselves? But at the same time, you know, like, obviously, if you ask me now, do you feel like I've been successful? I would say yes. Okay. I would say yes, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've had like multiple platinum hit records. I've got residencies in Vegas, I've been for, I've toured the world, I've had a number one record. Um, no, this I've had success. But I think that's but, amazing that you've already you've got the ability to recognise now, whilst you're in the middle of it, that you've been successful. Because I think a lot of people maybe get caught up in what's next. I need to do something more. I need to prove myself more. But you're able to to juggle that ambition, but also appreciate that you're in the moment and this is exactly what you wanted. I think that's quite a rare talent, right? To have those two things working side by side. Well, I definitely the fire inside me to achieve more and my ambition is burning harder than ever. But I can definitely look at what's happened and be like, 
you know, this is amazing. This is the dream come true that I wanted. And, and I always remind myself that, that, um, you know, we spoke about it earlier, but whenever things are a bit tough and maybe, you know, the travel is getting a bit crazy or having a bit of a, a knock or something yeah. that's going on, I can still take those moments and be like, I'm so grateful to be here. Right. This is my dream. You know, I'm smashing it. And have those sort of reality checks if you want. And that must be really helpful in giving you kind of like perspective when things aren't going right. Because I think for so many people, especially in a high pressure, high stressful job where you're traveling a lot, it's very easy to be a prima donna or to really kind of lose your mind because you've lost your baggage or whatever it is. But if you can take that step back and realize that you're still, you're living your dream, I imagine that makes those moments that little bit easier to, to navigate. A hundred percent. And I think that also definitely keeps you grounded. Okay. Um, which is important because things do get crazy. I mean, like, you do get these, you know, life is constantly these mad experiences and people fussing over you and everything going on. So you do need to take those moments to stay grounded. And, um, you know, that will never change with me. Whatever happens in my life, I will never, I won't change. I'm still, I'm still the same person I was, you know, from years ago. It's, it's just, the things I'm doing have become bigger. Yeah. But so if it all gets taken away my, tomorrow, my, you're going to be you're going to be pleased with yeah, what you've done. Yeah. I mean, if that happened, I wouldn't be pleased. I would be like, <laughs> but um, but yeah, my mindset though has not changed. I'm still, you know, the same person before. Sorry, came out. And know. nothing's going to change that, right? No, nothing's going to change. That's what I mean. However big things get, I won't change as a person. I know that for sure, man. Once you've spent even a little time with Joel Corey, it's impossible not to find yourself in his corner, rooting for him to succeed and to achieve more of his lifelong goals that even just a few years ago seemed impossibly out of reach. His passion and drive are infectious and his willingness to sacrifice romance and relaxation in the pursuit of taking his place in the pantheon of DJ legends. In short, to become immortal means I'd bet my last dollar on him achieving his ultimate ambition. As for whether he'll remain the same rounded and grounded guy if he does, I wouldn't bet against that either.